Hi, welcome to the Uplife Studio podcast, a space where we strive for an upgraded lifestyle by empowering personal growth. This is Vojko Mihnia logging in from my Beijing studio. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing and having a chat about life in general and a very, very important aspect of life, art. My guest today is Leo Li. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. I know it's a pretty tight space over here, but it's a pleasure to have you here. Who is Leo Li? Leo Li is a good colleague of mine and he is a Beijing based American digital artist. How does that sound? That sounds uh, <laughs> uh, that sounds like a good idea for me to want to be here. Yeah. The and plan today is to talk about art, especially digital art, mm -hmm. right? But before we start, let's kind of have like a operational definition of what art is, right? For me, art is anything that is aesthetically beautiful, aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to get into the, uh, you know, the branches of art and the philosophy of art from a personal point of view. Does, can everyone understand art? Yes. What do you think? Yeah, I mostly agree. I mean, we're talking about visual art, right, here? Yes. Um, I think for a good operational definition, that's pretty good. It fits pretty much anybody who is looking at art, looking interested in art, learning or buying art. Yeah, vis aesthetically pleasing is, is a pretty good broad definition for everyone. Um, so you know, what is art to you then? Well, yeah, I was going to say, as, a, as an artist... It becomes very contextual and, you know, I'm going to try not to get into too much semantics, but like what is art when you're studying it? What is art when you're when you're looking at it? Um, the definition does change a bit. Uh, mostly for an artist, um, we look at art, visual art, as a, well, it is definitely, there's the aesthetic side. Yeah. Um, but for us, that breaks down to a set of skills, sets of... Um, visual cues and other things that I won't go into in too much detail. Um, and also it breaks down to also the expression, the side of it that is the expression of the artist. Um, where is the artist in the art? And But that's a different context. And at the same time, like, where is the viewer in the art? Yes, right? that what too. Maybe what looks, seems like a beautiful piece of art to you looks like just an average piece of mm -hmm, art to me, right? Yeah. So that's why I'm trying to say, like, there's a my definition of art and my interpretation of art. How is that viewed from an artist's point of view? I think it's the same, yeah. Like the third person aspect of that is the same, right? You viewing my art, me viewing somebody else's art, it's totally the same. I think that's fine. I don't think there should be any conflict with any definitions there. Yeah, there's, you know, in the working with the art, in the creation of it, the definition is really changing at gray. But yeah, if we're at an art gallery or a museum and we're all looking at art, um, I think that's that's a really good definition and way to look at it. Mm, so when I say art, the first thing that comes into my mind is the great wave, hokusai's mm. size, beautiful woodblock print. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that to me is like, if I say art, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's like the highest peak for me to, uh, to not, I don't want to say compare, but when I say, oh, what, what, what kind of art do you like? I would say that. Okay. Like, where do you stand? What's your... Um... Well, I can certainly say, uh, see why. The Hukusei wave is certainly probably the most iconic piece of Eastern art ever. Uh, in, in the West, it would be, I would say, the Mona Lisa, you know, for a lot of people. Yeah. There's Starry Night. There's also the, the famous Chinese horse painting. Right? These are like the icons that yeah everybody has that flash picture in their head. And for you, it's the wave. And th I mean, that definitely is it deserves to be up there. I mean, it's up there for a reason. Mm. So what about you, like personally? When, when I think like art yes. was the one What's What's the one piece of art that comes into your mind when you say like, yeah, that's <sighs> like the highest, uh, you know. Oh, oh, okay. So I think for most artists, we wouldn't say there is a highest. It's... If you go back to even like the old cave paintings, right? The oldest mm. cave paintings found in France. I believe, Beautiful, right? yes. Yeah, yeah. And I go by what my art history teacher once taught me, professor, sorry, that it, in art history, we look, we start with the cave paintings, we move forward into the Renaissance and all the, you know, abstract Ego, like, and everything like that. Yeah. And the idea that he said that I hold by is that art changes, but it doesn't get better. 
Mm. Right. So, you know, you have the Hukusei wave, you have all these other pieces and there's changes, a lot of change. And there are iconic pieces that define eras and they define genres, but they don't get better per se. Um, so I, I would say that for me, uh, a defining piece would be like the Mona Lisa for me. The Mona Lisa. Have you yeah. seen the Mona but, Lisa? But I won't say that it's, you know, that's at the top of some kind of a hierarchy. Have you there. seen the Mona Lisa? In person? No. In person. No, but I've heard all the stories and I've seen photos. We, we were in France two years, three years ago on our honeymoon doing the tour of Europe. And obviously the Mona mm-hmm. Lisa was up there on the list. Well, of course. And it's like you entered the room and they're like you're you're surrounded by like <laughs> amazing artworks yeah, yeah. worth millions and millions of dollars and everyone zooms into the Mona Lisa, not to be racist, like it was full of Asian tourists, everyone holding trying iPads, holding iPads holding and iPads. trying to, to squeeze in a selfie. And I know my mom told me like Mina, it's so small, it's like so disappointing, yeah, yeah. and it's so small <laughs> and so disappointing. <laughs> yes. I mean, I can see why. I've never seen it. Um, I had the exact same experience. I've heard that story. Uh, I went to the Sistine Chapel just mm-hmm. last year. Yeah, exact same experience. Because you walk through the whole museum, right, in the Vatican. The Vatican Art Museum yeah. is gorgeous. Paintings from the floor to the ceiling. And you finally you get through the Sistine Chapel and there's crowds and crowds and crowds of people. And you get there and it's... Um, That's it? Yeah. Well, you have to check your, your yourself because you have to realize, you know, then you have to realize this is you know, hundreds, hundreds of years old, right? And, you know, they don't want to, like, restore it. And the mm. rest of the museum, everything else is, you know, very different. But, yeah, yeah. It's, again, context. It's, it's all about the context. Yeah, I do hope that one day I will um, see a live, you know, reproduction of Hokusai the wave. There are quite a few copies in museums all over mm-hmm. the world. And I think that's the beauty of uh, woodblock printing, that you don't just get one. You, you can get many originals. And by original, this is one made by Hokusai himself, right? Mm-hmm. So I was in Japan a few years ago, and I was in uh, Kyoto, and I entered this art gallery. And guess what? They had like a mini station over there where you could have your own woodblock printing. Right. Did you get one? It was totally free of charge. The lady's like, yeah, look, this is the process. And I was so excited. And I had my own little like, uh, you know, woodblock print. Mm-hmm. I know you're also a, a Japan geek. I am a Japan Japan geek. Yeah, Japan geek. Well, for me, the love of Japan comes from martial arts and obviously later on movies and art and every, everything that's Japanese. What about yourself? Well, I would say I'm a Japan fanboy. I'm fan not a geek because okay. I don't actually know a whole lot about it. Okay, so that's the yeah. difference, right? What's I, I, the difference? I guess so. <laughs> uh, f- yeah, for me, I've always been into Japanese art, of course. Um, I mean, you would, I would surmise that most young aspiring artists at some point go through a Japanese art phase, Mm. right? Anime, manga. um, Japanese art is very accessible from a young age, right? If you look at, compared to like classical Western art, it's not really accessible to teenagers. I mean, sure, you can look at it, but they don't, you know, it's not modernized. They don't connect. So Japanese art, you connect with it at a young age and and it goes up from there. And for the Western world, there's also that mysticism that's about it. And the idea that this is like in a far, far away land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what... Yeah, while you you would go to a a local uh, museum and you would see like expressionist art and so on and so forth. And like, there's nothing Japanese here. Like, where's the Japanese stuff? Yeah, yeah. In, In my art history, art appreciation courses... Uh, in high school, college is, you know, 95% Western art. Obviously. Western art. Cause, well, I don't want to say because I don't really know, you know, the exact reason why. Mm-hmm. I, could, I can guess, but... You know, so, just be... going back, wh- where, is the, uh, where is the fanboy coming from? The ja- Japan, Japanese fanboy. Well, like I said, it all starts with accessibility. You know, Japanese art is still current and it's still changing, right? Obviously, it goes back, you know, way back, but there's, Japanese art is still evolving, it's still moving forward. Um, and I think that's why most people like me get drawn in at an early age. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper, right? You start with, I don't want to say shallow, but like, I'm going to say shallow things like manga and anime. Like surface level. Surface level. Al- although good. even surface for level. manga, it's yeah. like, it's it's, a, it's an amazing art form. Exactly. But you can really go in and as you go in, it just keeps going and going and going. So it's very easy. That's kind of how I've spiraled into that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the rest of the culture and everything follows once you get into the art. But it was the art then. I got into at first. All right. And then how did you get into digital art? Right? Because there's Mm. there's like this huge, I don't want to say debate, there's a huge difference of how how young people are more drawn to digital art because of the technology. Right. Yeah. I I I don't know. I from my time in Asia I have not seen that many students 
mixing colors and painting, but I've seen almost like every other student sketching. Yes. Well, sketching is basic, right? I would say you really can't become a visual artist if you don't start with hand sketching things. It's, the, it's your first interface. The first interface with art is your body, right? your hands, for the most part. Although, uh, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. We had an, uh, there was an art student in my college who was a paraplegic. Oh. And he would come to class with, um, he would be in an electric wheelchair mm-hmm. and he would operate it with his mouth, with a joystick. And um, the teacher would set up a sketch pad in front of him and put a, a pencil in his mouth. And every class, he would sit there for 40 minutes and draw draw that way. So, you know, just... But, the, I mean, your body is your first interface. It doesn't have to be your hands. And how... Right? So your first contact was, was sketching, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever since I was... God, what, what did you used to sketch? My earliest memories. <laughs> As a kid? Um, you know, you I'm start... still drawing. You know, when I'm, when I'm stressed out, you yeah. know, I draw in my hand like a boat, the shape of a boat. The shape of a boat. And, and then I have like a sail. Was that, was that a boat you just drew? Yeah, okay. it's like my weird shape of a boat. Okay. And that's how it keeps a me Lego. like... You know, I, I stay focused or like whenever I'm excited or whatever. Mm. That's the first, the first image I go back to. But that's a memory of you have of when you're actually drawing the boat. Yes, the but right now I draw it in my head whenever I'm like stressed <laughs> out over something. Huh. Very weird. I don't do that. Very that's weird. That's interesting. So how, what was your first interface with art? Obviously sketching. What did you yeah. sketch? Oh, as a kid, you sketch animals. We really, we being my, me and my brother, we both um, did art. We grew up together mm-hmm. doing art. Bugs. Bugs. We, had a, we, didn't do a, we had a bee phase. We would just draw bees day in and day out. And then it was like dragons, moved on to um, um, army stuff. We just like draw battleships mm. and tanks. Uh, Speaking of animals, is it true that the humans. it's the most difficult animal to draw is a horse? I think I read that well, somewhere. If you read that, then that's one more point of data than I have. Okay. Horses are difficult to draw, for sure. Um, I don't know if there's any definitive difficult animal. Mm. Anything, if you practice it, becomes second nature. So um, horses are they, uh, horses are difficult because their musculature is very visible. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it's also very subtle. They have horses that have very fine coats. So if you're using like a pencil or if you're doing it by line... Um, it's hard to, there's a really fine balance I w- you would have to keep. Um, I have drawn horses, but not, I'm not like a horse specialist, of course. Do you know anything of these uh, amazing Chinese paintings of horses? Yeah. What's the, the thing here? I'm What's not the, an expert on wh- that. Why are they only about horses? I would imagine it's dragons, <laughs> you know? Well, they're not only about horses, but the, uh, there still seem to be a the vast majority ones are. of horses. That seems to be like a standard, right? I don't know how that got started. You know, I'm not an expert in the history of that. Um, the most, one of the most famous Chinese paintings was of is of the horse that's that's galloping. Mm-hmm. Right, the other one being the river crossing. So I'm not sure. Um, you know, my guess this is just a guess is that that was kind of the standard for teaching. Yeah, right. You would teach painting, and the practice would be doing horses. <clears throat> so, what was your teaching? What did your teachers teach you at in art school? That was what pretty. Did you guys do pretty classic stuff. Um, you start with. You know, lines and line drawing, drawing patterns, repetition. And still life? Uh, you Eventually, you move into still life. Mm-hmm. In high school, it's just all kinds of stuff. It's just a hodgepodge. So draw your hand. Okay. Draw a classmate, right? Draw this, some maybe some still life. I just remember. And the other weird thing that I used to do draw was a house. Like, how old are we talking about? Very here? geometric. No, this, you're, Tom, you're asking me, like, what uh-huh. are the things that you, I give you, a, a, like, a, a piece right. of paper and you do something. I would draw that boat and the house. Uh-huh. Like very geometrical. Very For basic. using an etching sketch? <laughs> I don't know. So how, how did you move into uh, digital art? Okay, so for me... This was one... it, like, sketch in digital art or did you go through, like... Kind of. Yeah. Acrylics, uh, oil right. paints, and... No, so this is a personal story for, for me. I don't know how everybody else does it. I always drew with pencils, and eventually I moved into ink, just black ink. And I never liked to color anything, right? Um, I, I never learned... Actually, I never formally learned painting. Was that an issue with your teachers? No, no. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of tracks. I, mm-hmm. I started in a community college, so okay. they didn't have, like, dedicated serious art programs then i moved into a uh, what's like a game design school i majored in game design with an emphasis in art okay um so there's mostly multimedia digital stuff uh, i moved into digital i took on digital very well because it was an easy way for me to learn to color and add color to my pictures just select color 
press uh, it's filled well, out. <laughs> it started like that. It started like that. Um, and it moves into what I did later was I would draw pictures in grayscale and ink mm -hmm. and I'll take a photo of it and then I'll put it in Photoshop and edit out the thing. And, um, you know, then it, there's gradients and stuff. So you can't just use the paint bucket. Um, but there's tricks and things you can do. So it allowed me to add color and then I could learn because you have to learn color theory and stuff. So that's really how I got into it. That's how I got into it. And let, let's talk a bit about how you became the artist in China. I remember we were on a bus one the day and, and we uh, we talked okay. about our lives before our current full-time job, right? All right. And I said, yeah, I used to be an artist. Like, I said, what? You used to be an artist? Like, where? <laughs> so what was that? So what, what's that story? Okay. What's it like to be like an American, <coughs> an American artist in China? All right. So the story is uh, one of my first jobs in China because I am an American citizen, right? Uh, though I was born in uh, Nanjing, China, is I got a job in Shenzhen as a concept artist for a company called um, Fanta Wild, which is a subsidiary of some huge conglomerate. And I worked on the- Or Shenzhen, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, it has to be big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's huge. It's a holding company, essentially. But I worked on many cartoons. The most notable one that people may know is, is called Xiong Chu Mo, and the English is called Boonie Bears but nobody knows the English name. Uh, so I was a concept artist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got that job through some connections in my major and stuff. Uh, and what a concept artist basically does is... The first sketch, right? Yeah, we do the very, very early sketches. Um, the first part of one of these projects is writing. People will write out a story. And then the concept artist would get the script or whatever. And we would just draw just whatever comes to our mind. Uh, and then people will look at the script and look at the pictures and decide if they want to invest in producing, you know, this cartoon or producing mm -hmm. whatever it is. So that's what I did. Was it good money? No, the money was terrible. It was, I was losing money for about a year and a half in China because I, I had school loans. You know, I just finished mm -hmm. uh, college. So I was paying that off. Um, I had other kinds of things. And but did you learn anything from this job? Yes. Yeah, that's why I stayed for so long because I, I was learning so much, especially... And I was learning so much, mostly because for the first time I was working with a group of other artists, experienced industry artists. Um, and you learn so much and so quickly from them. So much faster than what I learned in college. Not I think, that what I learned in college. Yeah, I think that's one of the best important. ways to learn is like to actually be on a job with someone who knows way more than you. Absolutely. And not be really tied down to a like a salary that, okay, I'm doing this job for the salary. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I was losing money for a year and a half straight. And the reason I finally quit was because I basically f ran out of things to learn there. The coworkers were great. None of them were making bank. That was also before they sold the cartoon. Um, before they sold Xiong Chu Mo, the bear cartoon, um, the company wasn't really, you know, well known for its cartoons. They were selling a lot of their cartoons productions in uh, third world countries. So how does it work? They create a cartoon and they sell it off to some other company? They would sell it off to stations, you know, other studios. To maybe. use it as what? To to run it, TV stations and oh, stuff. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it was like a proper show. Yeah, it's a proper show. And the oh, you know, Chong Sumo was not the first cartoon that they had produced. They produced a bunch of other uh, cartoons. A lot of them with animals for children. Um, and like I said, they would they would sell them in mostly third world countries, um, because third world countries don't have the the money to really buy the licensing for. Uh, you know, cartoons like Marvel cartoons or mm -hmm. other kinds of, you know, Disney cartoons and things like that. All right, so let's let's go in a bit into uh, the technological part of digital art. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you believe me, but I'm kind of a, or I aspire to be a technology minimalist. I know you you look around here and go like, really, yeah. really, but uh, like everything you see is used for something, and it's there's yeah. nothing that's, that's point. not needed, right? When you start in digital art, is there like a basic device that you need? Photoshop. 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 That's <laughs> it. Well, okay. Now I'm not, yeah, full, full disclosure, I'm not sponsored by Photoshop at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. You need a good draw painting software. All right. Photoshop is the industry standard. It just happens to be. And uh, for digital art, um, you have to learn how to use a stylus, some kind of a stylus hardware. So that's that's it. That's it. You know, there's also, there's coral paint and, and other I things. I was talking to another guy the other day and I was like, oh, the new iPad is out. Have you mm. seen the new stylus? And I was like, do you really need it? FYI, the iPad stylus is not that great. It wasn't really designed for art, like mm -hmm. like hardcore art. It's not that great for it. But I do use the iPad now and the iPad does have free apps that are 
for day to day, for especially for hobbyists, are comparable to Photoshop, and it's free. Photoshop is very expensive. So, what what does the industry use? Photoshop. Photoshop. And uh, what about the hardware? Like maybe Illustrator. It depends on the nature of the project. Hardware. Macs are still pretty much the industry standard. Uh, a lot of people will use some kind of a touch screen hardware. Okay. Yeah, so they have like full blown, or you can get smaller versions. Uh, or you could just how, use a normal stylus and pad. How, how does it feel to like draw on a, on glass? It takes a while to get used to. It really takes a while to get used to. Um, it's obviously much better than using a mouse. Um, obviously. Yeah, obviously. But <laughs> though interesting fact, my brother is a jewelry designer. And okay. for six years, he's been designing with a mouse. You know, once you really get used to it, the interface is really secondary. It is much harder to get used yeah, to. Yeah, on the sideline, I gave up on using a mouse my years ago. It, it's, I yeah, just don't to, use a mouse yeah. anymore. Even a stylus, because there's always going to be some lag. As even in like, the, even as the best in everyday uh, computer usage, not, yeah, not yeah, yeah. artifact mm -hmm. things. It's never the same. It's never the same as drawing on paper, right? I would work, you know, eight-hour days for a week straight doing a, a drawing stylus. You don't notice it, but then you go back, you get a pencil and paper, and it just feels like it's just an extension of your body hmm. once you get used to it. And it's like, for example, in videography, like everyone wants the latest camera, like the best gear, the mm. best, best of everything, because mm. only then you can get the best image. Is that the case in digital art? No, 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 no. You just need that. Talent, if you're chasing right? to be the best, the best, the best, then I guess you're more of an enthusiast and hobbyist. If you're a professional, you, you need the baseline stuff. Because there is all specs when you're a professional. Mm. You know, if somebody needs a work, they tell you the resolution they want it at. Right, and they tell you the style. You have that. You don't need the best gear to achieve X resolution. All right, speaking, that's all it is. Yeah, speaking you know, the of file size, whatever. Speaking of which, let's talk a bit about the gig economy, especially in digital in the digital art world. Mm -hmm. The logo for this podcast, the face. Yeah, it's great. My I face. Love it. it was uh, sorry, guys. It was a five uh, dollar gig. Five dollars. It was on Fiverr. And I paid this dude five dollars. I sent him a photo, a random photo. It was actually a school photo. <laughs> it was like my ID okay. photo. Okay. And he came up with the head. And it's just amazing. I can't believe you got it for that long. It's looks now good. I know what he did. Now you said five dollars. Mm. I kind of know the process that he would have gone Probably through. Probably he scanned it and he Yeah, he, he scanned it, it, put it on a filter, uh, yeah, outlined it. Is uh, is the gig economy still alive? Well, I'm a bit out of it now. It is still alive, that's for sure. You know, I do pick up some odd jobs here and there. I still ha I have some running work as well. So it is alive. Um, there's a lot of, you know, freelance websites now. But, like, I don't know too much of the details, especially, especially in China. Yeah. How do you define or categorize your work? I had a look at your oh. work, and it's 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 quite a lot of uh, uh -huh. fan, fan art for me. Yeah. Like you have this uh, Iron Man lady. Right, right. Iron like girl. That, that, that's so cool. Yeah, so I don't know if, if you're going to put any of these up somewhere. We will, we will. But um, I do do a lot of what I would call fan art as well now. Now that I'm not a working artist, um, I'm just trying to take Neither on... Neither a starving one, right? No, I'm not starving. <laughs> so I'm just taking on small... If it is a personal project, it's just something to keep me, um, keep me in practice. So it's whatever it is. Um, what I like to do, so like that... Iron Girl, one as an example. That's actually my friend, like the face and everything. Same with the posture. That was a photo of somebody. And I do this a lot with, what I'm doing is uh, figure studies. So mm -hmm. I'll take photos, other people's figure studies, I'll, and I'll do it as a figure study. But to keep it fun, over that figure study, I'll draw like a suit of armor or <laughs> a superhero costume. Or Sometimes stuff. use yeah. yourself as, a, as yeah. a hero, right? Yeah, I do have myself too. I'm a fan of pop, I don't want to say pop culture, but I'm a fan of good pop culture i guess so you know mad max mm -hmm. you know film definitely um, so i use that as part of my inspiration but under that what it really is it's figure studies line studies um it's exercises what do we understand what with. do you mean by line studies keeping your hand uh, hand eye coordination sharp doing that contour lines if you're in, okay. like if you're an artist you would you would like these are artist terms i mean they're beginner artist terms yeah keeping your lines clean contour lines you know uh keeping your shading so if you would stop practicing your skill would you lose it yes it's like riding a bike you never forget but you get worse you get worse yeah right? like you ride a you bike your balance. yeah it's all shaky and stuff um i used to be able to ride a bike with no hands mm -hmm. can't do that anymore so it's the same with art yeah and then where do you learn the skill is there like an innate 
part of that skill? Ah, uh, so yeah, this it's, is it's, getting it's interesting. It's a tough question, now. right? It is. So, where do you learn the skill? Um, is it innate? I would say no. All right, everybody has the same hands and muscles. Yeah, right? but I'm doing some this people thick have, man. Some people have, right? But you're doing it, right? That's the difference. So mm. all you are is you're further down the ladder, but it's the same ladder. Right, you keep doing that stick man is going to turn into a real man someday. And everybody started with a stick man, right? I started with a stick man too. So you know, yeah, some people's hands are a little more um, steady than those. some people are more patient with their art, but that more informs the art style. Um, it doesn't really control the the, the, the mm. skill cap that you people you know metaphorically may reach. So yeah, it comes down to practice. Comes down to practice. Practice in terms of practice. Yeah. But like, where do you learn it? The formal skills you'll learn in school. From, or All right. Teacher. Speaking of which, that was my next question. Mm-hmm. So if you have the skills, you have some talent, you're you're really like conscientious and you work hard. Do you need to go to school then? Or can you just jump into the art it world? Depends on your goals, you know? I'm just particularly talking about digital art right now, right? Okay. Like a... To be a working digital artist? No, to just be a, an artist. A digi- okay, to just be a, a recognized artist. artist. A recognized artist. No, like you don't to, have to, to go to school. To make a living out of short it. Answer, to, no. No, no. Short answer, short no. Short answer, no. Short answer, no. Long answer, probably should. <laughs> probably should. Maybe not school, but you need somebody who can teach you things. So you need right? to be it an can, apprentice. It can be a, yeah, a mentor. It could be a teacher. Um, and somebody good. You need somebody who knows what they're doing. I'm I'm obsessed with this idea of schools no longer becoming schools in the future, but becoming like the physical school will be just a parking lot. <laughs> can can will can and will this be done in the future online? Relative can you to learn? Art teaching? Yeah, can you learn this skill? Can you can you join this mentorship program where everything is set up for you, and depending on your choices, you will like branch in, into a different direction. Like there's this master program uh-huh. for all art, for all digital <laughs> artists. And then you branch into your little right, areas. Right, right. But no human interaction. It's already designed by humans, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then you just log in and you, you, you take your... Uh, mm-hmm. So again, short answer, yes. Right. But, you know, slightly longer answer, yes. Depending on who you are. Mm. Right? You know, you being a person who is... This w- like these things like because I'm also an educator, right? So this type of teaching and learning works for the you that is intrinsically motivated, right? That you, it's like okay, I'll I'll look at an example of something, then I will go and intrinsically I'm motivated to go and practice hours and hours and hours and hours of practice, right? So, but you know, for people who aren't intrinsically motivated to learn art, it's not going to work. They're going to watch a video on how to do it. They're not going to go do it. They're not going to do it. So yeah, right. So. You still need to go to art school. Um, well, oh. like you said, like does there need to be a human interaction? If that human interaction facilitates your motivation to go and practice it, then yeah, you'll need human interaction. But not everybody <coughs> necessarily needs that. It comes down to for art, it comes down to practice. It's ninety nine right? percent. Spe- speaking of practice, practice, I've been in Asia for sixteen years, and every time when I have a misbehaving student, that <laughs> student is drawing an eye. An eye. Yes, everyone draws manga eye. Oh, okay, I know what you're what's saying. with the eye. The other day, I asked the student, like, can you just try something else? Like, <laughs> you've been doing this eye for the like an hour eye. now. He said, no, 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 but it's a different eye. You know, it's the same big, huge eye, and you're gonna put it on an Asian face. I know. <laughs> so, what's with right. the eye? What's with the eye? Um, Why not a nose or an ear? Right. Like, the ear seems mm-hmm. quite complicated. The ear is very complicated. Um, the foot is very complicated. And I imagine the hands. I see a lot of sure, people to right? get people down. One of the last things of anatomy drawing they get down is the foot. But no, the eye, I think a lot of that's just human nature. It's human nature to be to look at and be drawn to eyes. Um, and when you're practicing, it is human nature to be the most critical of the eye. So yeah, there's a book on how to draw comic book characters. Mm-hmm. And there's a page dedicated not to how to draw eyes dedicated to the importance of the eye. And the quote that I remember is, you can learn all the muscles. You can learn every single muscle in the human body. You know how to draw it because you, know, you see comic book heroes with Superman and their muscles. But it, uh, it says, at the end of the day, if you can't get the eye right, go home. No way. Yeah, because the writer, and this is, um, I mean, this is a guy who has worked in comic books professionally. Um, and I agree, I agree. If you're, if you're drawing humans, obviously, um, you know, the eye is the window to the soul. 
as they say. And a large part of that is not that the eye is particularly hard to draw. You know, it's a circle with an oval around it. Um, but it's the, this is the one thing that people look at, and it's the one thing we're most critical of. Because when you look at another human, you judge their intent and their feelings through their, through eyes, their eyes. And we do that with art. It's the same. So I think that's why people will naturally focus on drawing the eye and get, trying would, to get that perfect. Yeah. What would the progression from the eye be? What would you fo- <laughs> what would you focus on? Well, you're not really supposed to start with the eye. Okay. I st- I did the same thing when I started drawing people. You start with the eye, and most people do. You you're not you really start supposed with the with a with a with a plus. Right? <laughs> so if you're classically trained, you start with the plus. You know, yeah. There's other ways to start. Right, you can start with the silhouette. You can start with you know the line of action. You can start with you know you could start with the eye. You mm-hmm. could start with the nose. You know, as part one art study, uh, one way to study drawing exercise is to you know because you'll try and copy Uh, we did this with a piece of picasso's art one of picasso's line drawings Uh and what you do is you just you flip it upside down and you and you copy it that way so you're focusing on the lines you're focusing on proportions and relationships the elements of the picture because when you're drawing a, a person right side up you're focusing on the eye you're focusing on the ear you're focusing on the hairline um, but to break it down, you want to be focusing on the lines. On and the lines, it, right? You know, but so you know that's but that's you know a classical way to train. Do you do you think parents these days understand that kids can try art as a profession, as a career? <laughs> Generally, no. Generally, no. Right. That that's my feeling too. I had a parent, but I would agree with them. <laughs> I, I had a parent a few years ago, yeah. and she said like, "Oh, Mr. Simandan." Uh, my son wants to go to Japan and study manga art, and I'm like, "That's oh, okay. a that's yeah. a billion dollar business! Like, let him go for it." And I didn't even know there is a faculty of manga at a university in Kyoto. Like, isn't that amazing? That is. I'm not familiar with the actual industry in Japan. I'm. I mean, I'm, just, I'm sure it's humongous. It is. It is humongous. Where's the student from? The, this family. He was from the Philippines. The Philippines. Okay. And then I kept telling him, like, you need to come up with your own character mm-hmm. and your own, you know, your own, like, as you were saying, concept, right? Yeah. But the parents like, no, he's a smart kid. He needs to go to Canada. <laughs> and I think a few years <laughs> later, I, from- I met the parent and I mm-hmm. said, so what happened? So, oh, yeah, he went to Japan. Okay. So, well, where is he now? Oh, he's in a company drawing and he's being happy. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I know. Should, um, should the parents take this risk? I don't think it's up for the parents to take. I know. You know? Um, Is I it a risk after all? I think it's good for the parents to have that side of the argument, right? So, you know, being an artist, it's not the most financially secure job. Um, the reason being, when an economy, so no bigger picture here, when an economy goes down, first jobs that get cut are creative jobs. Creative. When the economy is healthy, though, art is great. When the economy is healthy, it's great. And in this case... If the kid can overcome the parent's pressure, that's a good indicator that the risk is low, actually. Yeah, he was talented. He yeah, was. and if he's, talented, if he's willing to overcome it, then... Because the biggest risk is the person giving up, mm. right? It's not the industry. Because it's hard, it's competitive. Billion dollars, but there's a million people trying to get in. So it takes that person that can say, you know, whatever you say, I love you guys, but I'm going anyway... What do you think is the future of art? Is it all going to be gone? Is it all going to be in a, a hologram in virtual reality? Well, that's not gone. That's still art. It's the, I like that. Yeah. Right? Well, like I said, art changes. Will it Will it change uh, mediums? Yeah. yeah. It's always going to change mediums. We're not painting on cave walls anymore. I wonder if the ancient cavemen, assuming they have some similar understanding of art, would look at digital art and be like, that's not art that's, <laughs> right no i keep you're not crushing the berries and crushing the bugs that make the paint that's art you know so well sensitivities change along with art what are you working on these days um, assuming that you're working on something i have a few projects you know i, I can't show them but uh still some concept art projects so- let's let let's fashion related I let's say. let's end this uh this podcast with okay. your your thought and creative process. Let's say you have a blank sheet, sorry, a blank screen. Mm. How do you start? Do you already have in your mind what you want to create or you just like doodle? <laughs> I won't have a blank sheet in front of me unless I have something in my mind I want to create. That's definitely not the only way to work, right? You know, Pollock, I don't think 
would do maybe work like that. Mm-hmm. For me, yeah. If there's a sheet in front of me, I have an idea of something I want to create. So usually I'll start, I'm mostly pretty classically trained. So I'll start with light sketches, right? Get the composition down, get the major elements down. Then I'll move into some more detail work. Um, and I just move in further and further and further, more and more detail as we go down. And I start with pencil, usually color pencil now. Then I'll go in with uh, something darker. Then I'll go in with inks, right? And once all the detail is done, if I'm going to color it, I'll take a photo. I used to scan it, but now cameras are so mm-hmm. good on the phones. I'll take a photo, then I'll import that into an app, and I'll you know tweak it and then color it that way. So you start on paper, and then you go on, you go digital. If it's something I'm serious about, I will start it on paper. Okay. Yeah. If I'm doodling, I'll go straight into digital and do it in there. But if I'm, I'm serious about something, I start on paper. All right. Almost last question I ask you: you Send me your Facebook or your Instagram account. I, I don't. I don't. You I don't, don't have, have one. No, no. I know. That's, I'm old. That's 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 oh, crazy. Inside. That's crazy. What Is do you it? do with your work? I just archive it myself. It's for me now. I it's like a that. hobby. It's a hobby, right? Everybody does it differently. For me. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take a photo. I'll put it on my social media page, mm-hmm. whatever it is, WeChat. Yeah, I get the likes. I like the likes. I look at it, you know. But that's not at the end of the day. That's not why I do it. I like that. So why do you do it then? Because I just I have something to draw, you know. Um, I don't draw as much as I used to. I I don't. I just I'm not as inspired at this point in my life. There's enough food on the table. That's why. <sighs> that's one way to look at it. Certainly, there's there is enough food on the table. So yeah, I draw when I have something to draw and, you know, I'll, I'll send it up on online just to, cause a good part of art is really to con- be able to connect with people. Yeah. That's what, that was my next question. And if I'm lucky, like, I'll get some critique back. Yeah. So who do you show criticism. your art to? Well, online is everybody, but okay. like, if I want to like go out of my way and show my art to somebody, um, my brother, right. Cause he'll give me some honest critique. Mm-hmm. My father. How do you take it? He's the one who taught us originally. Well? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing personal? No. I mean, the people who I would send to critique my art know you how to would critique listen art. To, my okay. brother's a trained artist. My father was uh, also a trained artist. My Some of my friends in Shenzhen, and is they not, know how to and critique. And not, it has nothing to do with your DNA, the fact that you, you're an artist. It's, it's inborn, man. <laughs> well, yeah, there's the figure of speech, right? In China, they say, I don't have a single artistic cell in my body. It's like a Chinese expression, right? Is so it, you have artists in the family. Right. Well... I mean, I'm also very scientific minded. I think everything in the end is kind of in your DNA, but it's not direct, right? It's emergent of a variety of traits from your DNA. But In my book, 10 Step Guide to an Upgraded Lifestyle, I encourage mm. people to pick up a hobby, right? Like there's your eight to four job, then there's a side hustle, a project that you want to like, let's say monetize. And then I mm-hmm. also encourage people like, you need something to just do for yourself and detach. Do you think people could just pick up digital art if they had like a, a slight interest in in digital art? Yeah, would I think it be a good uh, a good hobby for them to try? Yeah, if you can, if it's the kind of thing you can just zone out and do, and 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 by the time you're done, you feel happier, rested, and whatever it is. Then yeah, yeah, you know, it's not for everybody, but for those who have a creative streak, artistic mm-hmm. streak. I highly recommend they they try it. I like the fact that with art and with like anything that you make with your hands, there is an end product. Yes. You know, there is something to look at, there's something to touch, there's something to something to share. To share. Even even with music. I'm I'm not a very musically inclined person, but okay, you can record your music, although it's very like, you know, a fleeting uh, sensation. Yeah. Like if you didn't press that record button, man, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah. Well, music is a performance art and has a whole different field of art. That would be good discussion for another day. Performance art is there and then it's gone, right? Thank you so much for mm-hmm. joining me. Thank Leo you Lee. for having me. I hope to have you back. I'd love to be back. Some other day. Until next time, this is Vojko Michnia signing out from Beijing. Ciao. Bye.